Hi, it's Robin McMahon here. I'm the host of Parenting Our Future. And if you're listening to this podcast, I want to thank you so much for being here. I also want you to know that I'm a former angry mom. I used to yell and rage and threaten and punish my kids because I wasn't getting the cooperation or the behavior that I felt I should be getting. And I struggled for many years, not knowing how to change or knowing what to do differently. It wasn't until I found the world of peaceful parenting that I learned why my kids acted the way they did and also why I was so angry and triggered. I was able to heal my anger and leave my triggers behind so that I could focus on being the calm and confident parent I always expected myself to be. I can tell you that feeling connected to your kids is the best feeling in the world. My two boys are teenagers now, and we have a strong relationship that is rooted in deep connection. And where there is connection, there's cooperation. Parenting is the most important job we do, but it's the hardest job we do. And we do it without understanding the fundamentals of the way our kids grow and develop. We do it without knowing the way their brains work or what their behavior is actually really telling us. So it's no wonder it's so hard. And it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say, this is harder than I thought it would be. And that's where I come in. I can help you and I can support you so that you can have the cooperation and enjoy being a parent. You can book a free call with me on my website, parentingforconnection.com. And if you want to download my free guide, how to turn a no into cooperation, go to triggerfreeparents.com. I really hope you enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Parenting Our Future. This episode is one of my favorite ones, and I have found this conversation so fascinating, and I hope you will too. It is so fascinating how our brain takes in information, how we have biases, and how this whole polarization around the pandemic has created so much division and why it has. And I'm fascinated by it. And I know you are too. And so I have Dr. Seema Yasmin, and I want to read you her bio because she is so interesting, so well-educated. And I just really want you to hear the quality of guests that she is and how honored I am to have her. So let me tell you a little bit about her. She's an Emmy award-winning journalist, first and foremost. She's also a Pulitzer Prize finalist. She's a medical doctor and Stanford UCLA professor. Seema served as a disease detective in the Epidemic Intelligence Service at the CDC, as a science reporter for the Dallas Morning News, and a medical analyst for CNN. She's the author of five books, and her reporting appears in the New York Times, Rolling Stone, Wired, Scientific American, and on the BBC, NBC, and other news networks. Her unique combination of expertise as a duly trained physician and medical journalist have been called upon by the Vatican, the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues, and the White House, among others. Seema is the director of of the Stanford Health Commission Initiative, clinical assistant professor of medicine at Stanford University, and visiting professor of crisis management and communication at UCLA's Anderson School of Management. She trained in journalism at the University of Toronto and in medicine at the University of Cambridge. Her book, What the Fact, is a navigation guide for teens and adults on how to survive murky worlds of misinformation and disinformation and how to become savvy consumers of information. I absolutely love this conversation. I am so happy to bring this to you. I really hope you enjoy it. So welcome, Seema. I am so happy to have you here. I'm so happy to have you talk about all of this and your book, What the Fact. Um, Great name, by the way. And I've been reading it. And I have to say, you have such a great sense of humor and like a quirky way of writing that uh, is super fun and you make it really fun. So I just want to say that first. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for the the kind words about what the fact. I loved writing it, and thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, okay, so I want to start 
by just questioning you on a couple of things. So you're a doctor, you're a journalist, you have so many awards um, and accolades. And I love the fact that um, you were trained in, for journalism in the University of, from, of Toronto, which I'm a Canadian, so I do love that too. Um, but I want to talk about the pandemic and I want to talk about how this even happened. How is it possible that this happened was this created for nefarious reasons? Could this have been something that was avoided? Or are there people that manufactured this to make us, you know, for, for population control, to make us afraid, to make us stay home, to create inflation, uh, and to the, you know, and, 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 you know, to what end? Well, for a new world order. These are the kinds of things that I hear, and I wonder, with your background and what you know, what do you have to say about that? What do you say to people who say that stuff to you? So yeah, I'm a public health physician. I went to med school, and then I trained as an epidemiologist and was a disease detective at the CDC and was investigating diseases and disease contagion. Mm -hmm. And so I can tell you that not only was a pandemic predictable, we knew one was gonna hit us at some point, but it was so likely that it would be a pandemic caused by a new coronavirus. Because since 2002, we've had a few of these really large and troublesome epidemics caused by a new coronavirus. And it's predictable because of all the factors that go into making an outbreak happen. There's climate change, there's us infringing on where animals live. So there's a much more opportunity for infections to jump from, for example, bats or other wildlife into human populations. Then we have globalization, right? We can jump on a plane and take an infection with us in eight hours across an ocean. Mm -hmm. And there's the fact that we don't have good health care in many parts of the world. So those early steps where someone could get help, where there could be like a really good public health system that like nips it in the bud early on. We just can look back two years ago and see where all those opportunities were missed, where politics gets in the way because one government doesn't want to be transparent with another government, doesn't want to be transparent with the rest of the world about what's happening in their within their borders. So to put that there, this was not surprising to many people in my field. Of course, it's mm. trouble. I can hate it, but it's frustrating. And the point is like, we told you so. Um, as you know, like in 2009, we had the H1N1 flu yeah. pandemic. And of course, one example is that we had a national strategic stockpile in the US that has all the kind of stuff you need in an emergency when people are getting really sick. We used up a lot of that stuff in 2009, including things like N95 respirators, we didn't replace them as if we weren't going to have another outbreak of something that would be spread via, you know, the air or via droplets, for example. We just weren't prepared in very basic ways. So although I was raised in very much a conspiracy theory way and, you know, happy to talk about that. One of my earlier books talks about my my upbringing as someone who was who believed in conspiracy theories and my community used conspiracy theories to make sense of the world. Now I can tell you what feels really conspiratorial actually in reality is governments failing us over and over again and not doing mm. the very basic, very obvious things of having a national stockpile that's actually stocked with the stuff you would need if a virus, a viral outbreak um, comes about or the government's ignoring scientists who just a few years ago, just a few years before the pandemic, were publishing papers in medical journals saying, hey world, we've been doing these like surveys and tests about um, among bats in the wild and we keep finding these coronaviruses in bats that look like they could jump from bats to humans. We need to be aware of this. And of course, their, their alarm bells and their red flags weren't heeded. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's the kind of, if you want to be conspiratorial, it's like, why are governments failing us? Why are public health systems so underfunded? Why is healthcare coverage so patchy so awful why is it always you know people of color poor people people living in rural parts of the country or the world that are hardest hit so I mean that's my thinking on it and I think I try and make uh I try and form beliefs and opinions based on evidence and I think there's so many things that point to this was going to happen it was a matter of when and we failed at preparing for the predictable mm. So this didn't come out of a laboratory in Wuhan. 
So some reports will tell you that that might seem more likely now. People may have seen the recent ProPublica and Vanity Fair reporting. And I've taken a look at it and I don't think it's robust. And I have no agenda in this. I'm not pro-government or whatever, right? I just want to yeah. know what happened so we can prepare for the next time. And if it came from a lab, how do we ever stop that happening again? If it was malicious, how do we keep a handle on these things? But to me, based on the evidence, and I keep looking at it, it still looks like the wet market in Wuhan, where there were live animals, some of them possibly infected, that's where, to me, it still looks like all roads point to that, all arrows point to that wet market. So, you know, I'm very open-minded though, because I wrote a book a year ago called Viral BS, which is about uh, medical myths, why we fall for them. But it's about the times in history when governments have done things that are so egregious that they seem unbelievable. So I don't put anything past people in power, but looking at even the virus under a microscope, looking at its a genetic material, to me, if somebody wanted to artificially create a virus to cause mass harm, looking at the genetics and the shape and everything of this virus, to me, it's not the thing that you would craft. You'd actually make it even more easy. To, like there's just, there's just mm. stuff that would think a person would design this differently. So keep an open mind, keep assessing data as new evidence comes about. But to me, all roads still lead to that wet market in Wuhan. Mm. And the virus itself coming from epidemiology, from your medical degree, looking at it, you, what you're saying is if we were going to manufacture it, we'd make it a whole heck of a lot easier than the way it's actually. So. Yeah. And I've been having those conversations with colleagues along the way, because of course you need to prepare for bio warfare. It's definitely a possibility, right? Mm. It's happened before. It could happen again, but it just doesn't look like this is the virus that a person would create. Uh, to use as an agent of bio warfare. To me, it looks much more like a virus that's changed over time as it's jumped from one species to another. Yeah. But, and then I think it's important to keep doing the research, keep looking at what went wrong in the early days, keep looking at where it may have come from, keep looking at what happens when you don't have transparency and good relations between one government and another. Like this is where politics comes into play too. But then also like so much of the focus needs to be on the fact that pandemic is still here. It's still spreading. There's new variants still spreading. You may have seen at the moment, pediatric ERs and NICUs and PICUs are really slammed with kids with COVID and also with RSV and flu. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure we're keeping attention on what's happening right now too, not just on what happened a couple of years ago. Well, and is that that RSV and flu, is that not a part of us being sheltered from viruses over the last couple of years? Could be. And I, I've definitely had this theory that now that we're traveling more and people aren't wearing masks on planes and stuff, that even friends of mine and colleagues who are getting just like regular colds, not they're testing negative for COVID, it's like the worst sore throat they've ever had, yeah. or like the, the worst cold they've ever had. And I'm like, yeah, I think that's a, a factor of us being sheltered, which but still was the right thing to do. And yeah. we still should be wearing masks when we're in public because COVID numbers are ticking up. Just last month, we lost about 11 thousand Americans, 11,000 people yeah. died from a disease that could be prevented if we were more careful, if we masked, if we got vaccinated. So the masks do work. Staying away from other people six feet apart does work. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And one thing that I noticed, especially when I first moved to the US for that, for the job as a disease detective, that was over a decade ago. But you know, when you move from one country to another, even when the same language is spoken, you still notice like cultural differences. Yeah. One thing you notice in America is people go to work when they don't feel well, like you kind of soldier on. And even the commercials for cough medicines and stuff is like, you know, we'll get you back to work. It's OK. Yeah. And That's I've true. always, as a public health doctor, I'm like, that's not good. Like if you have sniffles, if you, you know, you feel feverish, stay at home, look after yourself, you'll get better quicker, but also you won't pass things on to other people. I thought that given what we've been through in the last two years, that there'd be a cultural change that people would be like, oh, I better stay home. But people aren't, people are traveling. And, you know, if you've been on a plane, you hear people with a hacking cough, you hear oh. people blowing their nose, you hear people that don't look well, and you're like, Ugh, why are you on public transport in this metal cage that we're all stuck in together for the next eight hours or so and then also you you know people go to work when they're not feeling well and so we keep seeing these COVID outbreaks mm -hmm. so things like that worry me like I wish what you know it's been a horrific couple of years but I wish some good had come out of it in terms of like oh I'll, I'll be really careful when I don't feel well but unfortunately I don't think we've seen those behavioral changes in fact it may have been the opposite everyone's just rushing to get back to being in person yeah. as much as possible and so we yeah. keep seeing the virus transmit and it keeps evolving and mutating oh yeah you know, that's, that's that is a real shame 
But yeah, that is a real shame. I have to say, you know, I had COVID not too long ago and for the first time. Uh, and I am fully vaccinated and, um, it really kicked my butt. It really kicked my butt. Cause I hadn't been sick in years. And, you know, I did feel that like, no, if I go out, I would wear a mask, you know, and it is, it is still a shock. Somebody was standing beside me and did a, like an open mouth cough right in front of me. <laughs> Could you, like not do that. Like where did manners go? But, um, what about the vaccine itself? You know, did it not, is it not a little scary that it was created so quickly and, you know, was, was, was put in us so fast? Is there, you know, what about a vaccine agenda? So I think it looks like it was developed super quick because COVID came along and how is it within a year we had a vaccine? Mm -hmm. But you have to remember there were groups of scientists around the world who are preparing for an event like this. And they were they would call it like disease X, something new, something unknown. How can you do steps one through nine, be ready so that the last, the 10th step is in relation to whatever that new virus is, for example. So how do we do all the groundwork? So we're so ready, we're so ready. And then when something new comes along, we just have the last steps to do to make the vaccine. We've kind of half got ready or we've half got planned or we've got things in process, uh, things in place. How do we do that last step really quickly? So I think that's why it seems like, oh my gosh, it was like the most quickly developed vaccine in history, which yes, it was, but there were decades of work that went into it beforehand. And mm. also remember that after SARS in 2002, there were scientists who were like, uh, this was really bad and it could be much worse in the future. We need to develop vaccines against coronaviruses. So there were people like Peter Hotez and his team in Baylor in Texas who already had a half-baked vaccine sitting in the freezer that they had developed since 2002. And the reason it was in the freezer was because they lost their funding because, you know, people became uninterested in coronaviruses. But then when COVID came along, they were able to thaw that and kind of get back to work and they weren't starting from scratch. Okay. So the Vax agenda, what, what do you say when people say that? What do people mean by that? Like there's some government conspiracy to put something in everyone's arms? Perhaps? Yeah, I think to put something in, in everybody's body, that it is a big moneymaker for pharmaceutical. I mean, there is a lot of mistrust for yeah. pharmaceuticals, yeah, especially right, when you look at opioid, opioids, right? I mean, it really no, is. Going back, and I've written extensively about this, like there's a lot of reason to not trust governments in general. But yeah. There's a lot of reason to not trust governments when it comes to public health and to healthcare. And there's a lot of reasons not to trust pharmaceutical companies. And I'll say that upfront as someone who has like rallied against them a lot because of things that they've done. You even look at what Johnson & Johnson is doing now in relation to people who've developed cancer, allegedly because of years of using a Johnson & Johnson talcum powders. Oh, yes. And they are doing the shadiest stuff you can imagine, like taking tens of thousands of lawsuits of cancer victims, transitioning them to an LLC, and then declaring their LLC bankrupt. Meanwhile, Johnson & Johnson is like one of the wealthiest corporations in the world and wealthier than many nations, you know? Wow. So yeah, why would people trust them? And I think this is why a lot of work has to be done in peace times, outside of a pandemic, outside of a crisis, to build trust. Mm -hmm. Governments need to do that. Corporations need to do that. And unfortunately, what often happens is we see governments fail as in ways that look really conspiratorial. Mm -hmm. We see drug companies rake in a profit. And of course, we've seen in the news recently with the stuff around Pfizer and how much they might charge in the future for a vaccine. So I don't, I, I think a lot of people are like, oh, you're, you're crazy if you believe in conspiracies. Um, and I just, I don't, I have a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion, one, because I used to be a conspiracy theorist, but because often there's something that happened that made people think in that particular way. And just to like give you some context, the, and I explain this in viral BS, I, I'm Muslim. I'm the child of immigrants from India. I was raised in England, live in America now, but when we were growing up, we'd hear stories about how horrible the British were to Indian people as they were colonizing India for hundreds mm -hmm. of years. 
-hmm. They took 45 trillion pounds from our economy over that time. And that's how Britain, partly how Britain came to be so wealthy. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, and also Britain was involved in the slave trade and really benefited of exploiting people. You're not taught any of that in the history books. And it sounds so absurd that this tiny island nation could have conquered like one quarter of the world. I think at one point, one in four humans on the planet was a British subject you know the queen was like one in four people's monarch and yeah, there's that I, she's mine or well was mine yeah right exactly and there's that saying that the sun never sets on the british empire and the blood never dries because that's how genocidal and horrific it was and oh. that's why we believed in conspiracy theories because things that had happened like partition like the emergency period in india are so horrific that they're kind of like unimaginable but yet governments did those things power hungry money hungry governments did those things so my thing is always like in a crisis why would a government expect its citizens to believe them to trust them with a quickly rolled out vaccination program so that work that's a failing of the government when there's low vaccination rates I think about five percent of Americans right now have received the bivalent booster it's atrocious Robin and yet what happens often in those conversations is like frustration like oh Americans aren't getting vaccinated and it's like "Mm, it's not just about individual choice that's definitely part of it but what have you done to instill trust in the scientific process Mm -hmm. what have you done to instill trust in how you care for the public and the U.S. has this long and sordid history people have probably heard of Tuskegee how black men in Alabama were kept sick with syphilis even once it was known that penicillin could cure them they were kept sick so that government scientists could study how sick syphilis made you and how it messed up your brain how it could cure you how you could pass it on to your unborn child and your unborn child would either die or be born with disabilities like the government did that right Sickening. And there's so many, and I go through many examples in viral BS that just feel like that, come on, that could not have happened. And they did happen. And mm-hmm. we have much evidence. We've sometimes gotten apologies from governments. So my thing is like, yes, let's, we, we keep having conversations about the end of the chain, like the individual, why are they not getting vaccinated? And yes, I work on that. Yes, it's very important. Yes, let's talk to people. But at the other end of the chain, you government in a crisis situation, you're not able to protect us because of your bloody history and your lack of atonement and acknowledgement and your trust building, that's essential work. Well, and I think too, when we see public health measures politicized over masks, let's just say. But then what is that, like everything is political. So I don't, I don't know. Like I'd I'd have that when I was on CNN, like, oh, you know, be careful when you go on talk about masks, like don't politicize it. I'm like, everything is a, everything is political. Like casting a vote in the midterms, that's political and it's impacting public health and it's impacting education. It impacts in 20 years, whether there's, whether there's another insurrection or not. It impacts in 20 years, how much people understand about science when there's another pandemic, because there will be more epidemics and pandemics. And what we saw in this one right now was we were having to try to catch people up in a crisis situation, mm. get them up to speed on how science works. And that's hard to do if you haven't built scientific literacy through a person's K through 12 education and you're trying to get adults up to speed on, well, Dr. Fauci kind of wasn't wrong when he said you don't need to wear a mask and he quickly switched and said you do. Actually, that's a good scientist. That's an honest scientist. That's a scientist who says I'm changing my mind and I'm changing policy based on the best available evidence. It was partly political too. The US didn't have enough N95s. He was scared that we would all run out. But can we have that as a an honest conversation as opposed to saying like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. How could he change his mind so quickly? Like science isn't a textbook. It's not a bunch of static facts. It's a process. It's a process of asking a question, having a theory and then testing that theory and being very open-minded as to what results you'll get. Right, right. And, and I think it's just hard because when you are looking at the information, it's it's like, well, how do I know what's real and what isn't yeah. real? Yeah. And I think that's that's really why I wanted to talk to you so much and why I think what you are sharing is so important. And you talk about like this 10 step recipe for misinformation. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so what I write about in What the Fact is kind of the disinformation playbook so that people can see behind the scenes what's happening when somebody is spreading disinformation. So one of the things I explain in the book is there's a difference between misinformation and disinformation. Both of them are under the umbrella of false information, but misinformation is the false information that someone shares with you when they themselves don't realize what they're saying is not true. And they don't, they're not saying it to try and hurt you. So for example, it might be like a friend saying, oh, I heard there's this mouthwash. If you use it, you've got 
gargle with it, you won't get COVID. I mean, no such mouthwash exists, but maybe they didn't realize that's not true. Someone, you know, duped them and they're saying it to you not to hurt you. They think they're helping you, yeah. even though they're not. But disinformation is different from misinformation. It's still false information, but disinformation is shared knowing that it's false and it's shared with the intention to deliberately cause harm and chaos. So we've seen this from foreign actors, bad actors, but we've seen it domestically too. One example is during the 2014 to 2016 Ebola epidemic in West Africa, where of course we saw a case of Ebola in Dallas, you know, a man flew from Liberia. But there was a time when Russian, Kremlin-backed Russian uh, operatives kind of hacked the Yahoo Twitter account, the official verified Yahoo account, and declared there was an Ebola outbreak in Atlanta, and there was not. And they created a CNN.com very, you know, duplicate site that looked legit, that declared Ebola outbreak in Atlanta. That's disinformation, because it's not true. And what you're trying to do is panic Americans, you're trying to get people in Atlanta to feel like, oh my gosh, I've got a headache, is it Ebola? You can very quickly overwhelm urgent cares and ERs to the fact, to the point that someone really having a heart attack or a kid that's really broken their leg, like, can't get the care that they need. So that's disinformation. And what I talk about in What the Fact is like peeling back the curtain on how the sausage is made and also <laughs> explaining like disinformation is not new. For example, during the USSR, the Soviet Union's KGB was using disinformation as part of its you know, information warfare. We're seeing it again with Russia now because mm. you can drop bombs all you want, but if you can seed information and propaganda, that is incredibly powerful. As we've seen, you can impact presidential elections in another country. You can cause divisions in a country that really polarize people and mm. don't even have for agreement or debate. So the disinformation playbook that I go through and what the fact, I won't go through all of it, but if you read it, it kind of talks about the fact, well, you want to spread a lie, but a really smart thing to do that makes the lie look real is you wrap the lie around a kernel of truth. Mm -hmm. And that really confuses people because there's something in there that's like legit. So the whole thing looks legit. And the example I give of that is this news site called Russia Today, which is a Russian, but English language also a news station. You can watch it online. You can read their articles. They are a part of the Russian, they're state backed, right? Part of the Russian government. But some of their reporting is really, really good at its factual. So what do you do if 80% is factual, but 20% is propaganda and yeah. you can't tell what's what? It's a really smart tactic to dupe people. Because um, I've read stuff in Russia today that I'm like, oh, I haven't seen American outlets covering that and it's actually legit. But I know you have to be so careful because a lot of their stuff is completely untrue. So wow. that's one of the tactics. And then there's, there's many more. But once you know what those tactics are, you start spotting the red flags a mile away. And that's how you get savvy on separating fact from fiction. Unfortunately, what we've done right now is just scare everyone, like fake news, fake news, everything's fake. People feel like they can't believe anything, which is not true. There's a lot of information out there that's very good, very accurate and fact-checked. Um, but I wrote what the fact to give everyone, especially young readers, but everyone, the tools to be really savvy navigating the world of misinformation and disinformation. Mm. I really like that you you just defined misinformation and disinformation. I definitely learned something because I would have used the two interchangeable, but you're right. Misinformation is like well-meaning here, use ivermectin, the horse dewormer, because that's really going to help you with COVID, which it doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. It does not. And the, and the disinformation might be somebody in a position of power, perhaps somebody selling the ivermectin completely knows it doesn't work, but wants to make money off it or wants you to not believe the legit scientists. So yeah, it could be the same information, but one person sharing it like, hey, I heard ivermectin works and you should have some just in case. And then the other one is like, ivermectin works, you should buy it off me. And yeah. the doctors and the government are lying to you. So yeah, the same piece of information Ooh. could work. Well, and, and I bring that up because a family member actually I said I had COVID, right? And they said, oh, shoot, I never thought to, to give you the meds. I've got all the meds. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, no, I've got the ivermectin and I've got, oh. and I, I, like my eyes popped, like almost fell out of my, my face. <laughs> I couldn't believe, well, I don't know why I said my eyes, my ears, whatever. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And mm -hmm. uh, anyway, there was, there was some justification and that's misinformation. They were not trying to harm me at all. They just don't know the difference yeah. anyway. So, okay. So that's really good. And that the, the, the recipe 
you know, now, but what, to what end, why would somebody like, I don't know how to ask this question. I mean, I, I understand money is a great motivator for many of these things. If we use the ivermectin uh, example, fine. That's, you know, trying to sell it or, 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 or whatever. Um, but why, why would, why would a, a, a government want to say that there was an outbreak of Ebola to what end? Is that just to cause chaos? Yes, to cause distrust in your own government. Okay. It's to show that they can meddle in things like the new, <laughs> excuse me. It's to show, hold on a second. Money is often a really powerful motivator, but it's not always about money. It's power at the end of the day. And so a bad actor seeding disinformation might be doing so because they want to influence who becomes elected in your nation's government because they like one candidate over another, for example, or they want to seed chaos. There was really good reporting in the New York Times a few weeks ago um, on, in the Sunday edition. You should look up um, the Women's March from 2017 was completely infiltrated by Russian operatives who wanted to seed chaos and distrust and basically fracture that women's rights movement. And they did it. Well, the way that they do this is they, they're like doctors. They make a diagnosis. They take a country. They treat it like the country is their patient. And they say, hmm, what already is like not working too well here? What are the existing divisions? Oh, okay, so this country's got racism. This country seems to already not like migrants and refugees refugees. This country doesn't want feminism or women's rights to succeed. And then they take those existing fractures and do whatever they can to deepen them. And that's why they've chosen like the election, presidential elections. It's why these bad actors have chosen things like Brexit in the UK, the referendum to leave the EU. It's why they've chosen the Black Lives Matter movement as a target and the Women's March as a target, because they're diagnosing what's already on its, you know, was already fractured and doing what they can, seeding disinformation to further deepen those divisions in that country. And by doing so, slowly, slowly, you start to unravel democracy. And we're seeing that in the context of the midterms, where there's such deep polarization and these lies about ballot mules and lies about fraudulent voting, which haven't panned out, um, despite arrests that have then had to be, you know, walked back. Um, but it, it manifests in very real life ways in the civic policing at the votes, at the voting centers that often are used to intimidate people of color. And um, yeah, it runs deep. It runs deep. Information warfare is extremely powerful. Why drop bombs when you can seed disinformation and send viral tweets that can have the same um, chaos causing effect? And kill as many people and harm as many people. Yeah. And traumatize as many people. Yeah. yeah. Four people go into the ICU and land in hospital because they refuse. And I wrote about them in What the Fact because they refused to believe that COVID was real. You said, Oh my God, you're in the ICU now. Why did you think this was fake? Because I saw it on Facebook. Yeah. The, the government was lying to us. So, and when you trace back some of these tweets and these Facebook posts, the account it comes from looks like it's an American person, very patriotic. You trace it back, it was actually a Russian troll who was paid by the hour to do that, to send Americans to the ICU with COVID by duping them into thinking it was a government hoax and that the pandemic was not real. Oh my goodness. Oh, so we, people are afraid and they feel powerless up against people who are wanting power and money. Is yeah. You, can, can, can you distill it down to that simple? I mean, power, yes. I think everything can be distilled down to power and power grabs and uh, wanting to use power to push particular agendas to create a world that looks the way particular people in power want it to look, which isn't always the healthiest version of the world, which isn't always the most democratic or, or fair or even distribute redistribution of wealth kind of look of the world. So yeah, it can come down to that. And I wouldn't use the words a new world order, but like I understand when people feel like that because look at the world around us and look at how these hierarchies play out. Mm. So is that why people want to talk about somebody like Bill Gates? And he seems to really, like, yeah. seems to really be this either 
uber evil uh, person uh, or he's just the subject of a lot of misinfor or disinformation now that I know the difference like what is the deal with that no okay so then we have to look at what happens during a crisis situation what happens during something like a public health threat where you have a pandemic that's caused by a very new virus that we've not seen before and what you have is a ton of unanswered questions right and what you have are legitimate scientists and legitimate government officials who will say to you honestly we don't know some of the answers yet it's so early we're gathering data what that does to the human brain is not good because we want answers. We want someone to connect the dots for us and give us a story that we can like, okay, and now I understand where this infection came from, how long it lasts, what it does and how you can treat it. That'd be great to know, but that might take a year or so to figure out. In the meantime, you have the charlatans come in and you have the charlatans come in and say, but I have the answers. This has not come from nature. This virus came out of a Chinese lab because China wants to kill Americans. And the government is now going to give us a vaccine that's got a microchip in it because they want to track us. Mm -hmm. So what happens in, the, in, in a crisis where there are so many unknowns is people exploit our fear. They prey on the fact that we're looking for answers. And in the midst of so much uncertainty, they come in and say, I've got the answers for you. And so even though what they might be saying is not very palatable, or even though what they might be saying seems really weird and even absurd and hard to believe, the human mind often wants to believe because mm -hmm. at least it's some sort of answer. At least you're connecting the dots for me. And often those things like, okay, blaming Bill Gates, for example, or microchips, they're theories that have been bubbling in the background previously. Perhaps they emerged during previous crises like Ebola, like Zika, and they just rear their ugly heads over and over again. But that's what's happening is people are preying on the fact that we need to make sense of a situation and they're promising us, answers even though they're fake answers in the face of legitimate people saying I haven't got any answers for you yet because it's just too early I think it's about sorry just just to think even about the crisis in um Houston at the Travis Scott uh concert I think where people died and it was like oh my gosh in a modern day concert how could it be so unsafe that people were crushed to death right mm -hmm. and so you're, you're, the mind boggles you're like how could that happen wasn't there police there didn't they have these things planned while you're thinking how could it happen we need to we didn't need to understand how the crowd control was done while all of those questions are unanswered while you're trying to collect the data what happened we had viral tiktoks saying that it was planned that it was a satanic ritual it was a satanic concert and that it was a sacrifice and you think okay, how the heck would anyone believe that? But it goes viral and people accept it and say, thank you for giving me a story. It's like a safety blanket, a security blanket. It's like, oh, you gave me something to make sense of this. It sounds wild, like a satanic cult and a satanic planned sacrifice of people at the concert, but it's better than what the Houston PD is saying, which is nothing because they haven't got any answers just yet. So it happens all the time. I think it's so important that you just said what you did about the brain, that the brain is searching for answers. And I remember early on when COVID first started, sort of feeling lost and being like, what the heck is happening? Like, I don't even know what, 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 like, what the heck is happening? What the heck is happening? Right. And, and I started to watch the news 24 seven, right. Because I'm looking for answers too. And I'm trying to like make sense of it. And, and to know that that's just what your brain is doing. Your brain needs those answers. And because we had never experienced anything like this, we had nothing to compare it to. Then you add in the fact, and, and I'm happy for you to correct me if any of this is wrong, but you add in the fact that we're afraid and anxiety is our way of keeping us safe because there is this invisible force coming to get us because we're wired for survival. So you add all those things up and it does make sense how things got so convoluted and mixed up. Yeah. And that's why there's a whole chapter in what the fact about how brilliant but funky our brains are yes. and why it's really liberating to understand why our brain, why we believe the things we do. And it's because of the way our brains are hardwired. And I couldn't write a book about viral misinformation and disinformation without writing about our brains, but it's really freeing once you understand, oh, yes. I get now our beliefs aren't based on fact as much they are a bit but not as much as I would like to think our beliefs are based on belonging and our beliefs Ooh. are based on what others around us believe because as humans we've survived for thousands of years and we've we've survived 
uh, predators by banding together and the way that humans band together is by believing the same things. Once you start understanding that we are interactionist more than we are intellectualist, actually, it starts to make sense why we would believe weird things. And it starts to make sense why a conversation about a vaccine or about climate change can get so heated. Mm. Because really, you're like, but wait, you don't believe in the vaccine works. I do. I've got some facts. You think you've got some facts. It never is as cool as you think that conversation will be. It gets very heated Mm -hmm. because our beliefs are not just about facts. They're about our identity. So challenging someone about their belief on the government, on their beliefs on COVID, their beliefs on vaccines or climate change can actually, that debate can feel like an attack against the individual's identity. And even if you don't realize that's what you're doing, it's not what you want to do, that's actually what you're up against. And so once you start to understand that, you start disagreeing with people differently. You start using different strategies to debunk instead of just saying you're wrong and no, here are the facts. And so I go through this in what the fact, and there's even script in the book as to how to have a conversation where you Love disagree, it. where you have the goal of shifting the needle a little bit and, and it can be done. There's evidence and there's research on how to do this effectively. But what we've taught people so far is like nothing about how to have a productive disagreement. So we think all disagreements blow up. You can never change somebody's mind it, or it's exceedingly hard. And actually the scientists and psychologists around the world who study exactly this, and I've condensed their findings into like an easy to use guide. This is how you can actually disagree with a friend or with your mother without burning bridges and like never talking to your mother again. And I have to say, since I've been doing like the book tour and interviews about what the fact I've gotten so many emails, Robin, from people who are like, I haven't talked to my family for about one and a half years because we had such a big fight over the vaccine and they just can't believe that I got vaccinated. I've gotten so many emails like that. It's heartbreaking. It but is. People completely come to loggerheads to the point they don't even talk to each other anymore. Yeah. And it becomes something you don't even want to bring up. Yeah. I don't even want to talk about it. So maybe you still have a relationship. You still go see your parents at Thanksgiving, but you just won't talk about the climate, the government or COVID, right? Because it's like those are off the table. It's so heated or about gun control or whatever it is or racism or feminism. But, you know, Uh, 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 name it. Yeah. I mean. Let's talk about TV, right? Um, so, but there are there are ways, there are evidence-based strategies for effectively debunking myths. There are evidence-based methods for having disagreements. Still, it's okay to disagree, but disagreements that don't blow up and actually leave the door open for that person thinking, mm, I might have to change my mind on this one. Right, right. And that takes a lot of courage and strength to say, yeah, maybe I will change my mind. I mean, yeah, that, that really, does. really does. Especially and- because of the way our brains are hardwired and because of the way our beliefs become part of our identity, it's it's hard to shift them. But one of the things I talk about in What the Fact is this idea that whenever we have a belief, don't think of it as black and white, like an on off switch. Think of your beliefs as dimmer switches. So you can believe a thing, have conviction, of course, but give a level of strength to your belief. Give it a seven or an eight. What that does, instead of just being like, yes, I believe, no, I don't, by giving it a seven or an eight, you leave your mind open to when someone says, oh no, but I read this new thing that actually says this. What happens is you're then not staunchly in one corner with your heels dug in going, no, 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 no. I believe this. You're like, "Mm, well, I've given that belief as a level of an eight. But now that I'm taking in this new info, I might have to crank that down to a seven or I might have to crank it up to a 10, actually. So it leaves you much more open minded. And what that does, this has been studied for decades now, is it makes you more mentally resilient to falling for lies because your mind is more open to taking in new evidence, reassessing your beliefs and being comfortable in doing that. That is a really great idea. And I just want to say, because I love talking about the brain, it's the same with parenting. When I can explain to a parent what's happening with it in your child's brain and their brain development, it helps you to just say, oh, okay, that makes sense. And I don't have to get so upset about it. I don't have to be triggered by it. You know, I can just say, okay, oh, that's just the way my brain is. My brain's just doing this, yeah, right? I, it doesn't have to be so personal. 
it's so liberating this happened to me yeah, recently yeah. Like, rejection sucks right yeah. but rejection sometimes sucks more than you think you know it should so say you don't get invited to a party but you kind of didn't want to go anyway and you're like oh my gosh why am I so hurt I didn't want to go but you're like this is silly so this happened to me recently and I looked I started doing some research into it and what I found is the part of your brain that processes rejection is the same part of your brain that po- processes physical pain And so it starts to make sense why things can literally like ache or hurt, like, you know, even on the inside. Mm -hmm. And I was telling a friend and I was like, that was because he has a similar issue. Like, oh, no one likes being rejected. And I was like, oh, it really freed me because it was like, oh, it's just my brain. It's like someone saying to you, oh, it's not that you're clumsy. You keep tripping over. It's that your shoes have a really weird heel. It's the heel that keeps tripping you up. And it just freed me of like feeling silly for being hurt over rejection. And so I think it's the same thing once you read that chapter in What the Fact, and it explains why we're biased, how we develop biases, how our biases show up, you start feeling less annoyed that you have biases, you kind of accept the fact that you're human, but you look out for them more, and you're just more aware of them, and you don't let your biases trip you up as much. Hmm. And I think what that does is it leads to more empathy, right? Yeah. For your fellow human, because we, oh, that's just their bias. That's, they just, they, that's just the way their brain is right now. Right. So does, and you started out by saying you have empathy for people. Yeah. It, and is that where that comes from? It comes from the fact that I used to believe weird things. And so <laughs> I don't discount anyone. I don't think it makes you silly. I don't think it means you're uneducated. I don't think that it means any of that stuff. I think we have conspiracies and we have stories to make sense of a very uncertain, very weird, sometimes very cruel world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that part for me is not difficult. The reason, if, if, if it is difficult for you and I get it, sometimes in the heat of the moment, if my aunt right now refuses to get her flu shot, she blames this weird rash she has on her COVID vaccine. I'm like, it's not because of that. It's this other thing. I can explain it to you. But so of course that still is like annoying. And I just kind of like want to throw my phone across the room because <laughs> I'm still human, right? I'm not a robot, even if I study these things. But the reason compassion and empathy is really important is what happens when you're in a conversation with someone who has a different world view to you. You just want to throw facts at them. You yeah. just want to throw the evidence. Well, you're wrong. Climate change is real because these studies show blah, blah, blah. Firstly, the person's probably seen that evidence the same as you have, and they didn't take it in and believe it in the way that you did. So why would just repeating it over and over do anything? You're just hitting them over the head and it Mm -hmm. feels terrible to them. It feels like you're attacking their identity. This is where empathy and compassion comes in because what Mm -hmm. empathy and compassion does is it shuts you up. What it does is it helps you ask questions and be quiet and zip it and listen. And that's really hard, but it's so essential. And the reason it's essential, Robin, And this is so at the heart of what the fact is that if say there are six people and all six of them don't want to get the COVID shot, we give them typically in public health the same message. We'll give six of them the same pamphlet, the same PowerPoint, the same messaging point. You should get the vaccine. It will keep you out of hospital. It's safe. It's got these ingredients. However, stop that. Talk to those six people and you might hear six completely different reasons as Mm. to why they don't get the COVID shot. One of them might have received every single shot that's ever been available, but they don't want the COVID shot because they're worried that it was made too quickly. Then there's another person who refuses to get any vaccine at all. Then there's someone who's kind of on the fence. Like, why would you hit those six people with the same pamphlet, the same PowerPoint, the same messaging points? They're coming from different places. They might even speak different languages and different dialects and come from different parts of the world and vote differently and have different faith traditions and ideologies and family histories and all of this stuff. So When you want to disagree with somebody, when you want to shift the way that they're thinking, you have to begin by asking questions. And that's really hard, but it's possible. And it requires a ton of empathy and compassion. But what you are doing there is golden because you're asking questions and you're listening. Listening. Yes. And there's uh, techniques in what the fact that are really like about active listening and how you can even show the person like I'm really listening and you really are taking it in. What that does straight off the bat is it shows them, oh, I thought she was just going to say I was a dummy. And I thought she was just going to say, because she's a doctor, she thinks she knows it all. She was just going to say like, well, of course you should get the shot and you're silly because you haven't. But no, she's asking me things and she's listening. And the person might be speaking some very silly things at this point, but you're going to keep listening. The second thing that it does, once you've already built that rapport and they're like, oh, I'm going to keep telling her stuff because she is listening. The second thing it does, they're giving you all the information you need, all the intel you need to then use evidence and effectively debunk because that you are understanding where they're coming from. 
why their beliefs about Bill Gates and microchips or climate change or racism or whatever, voting fraud, you are understanding where those beliefs came from. And only once you've started to gather some of that information, only once you started to have rapport and trust, do you stand any chance of gently building a relationship and then gently offering them some facts about well, you may want to consider this instead. But it's really hard to do that with any kind of success if you're not being a listener, a really, a really true listener, and if you're not gathering the intelligence on why they think what they think in the first place. Mm. You know, and I always think of it too, that when you can just listen, first of all, what the other person is saying doesn't last that long. Sometimes when you actually hear yourself saying it out loud, it does maybe sound ridiculous, you know, like I've, I've talked to people and, and I, I'll say, well, how come? Like, tell me, tell me more. And they'll say, well, it sounds dumb when I say it out loud. Well, okay. You know, and, uh, and also the more you argue instead of listen, it's like adding fuel to the fire. Yeah. Just being quiet. We just, we just so badly. And that's our brains too. We want to compare. We want to judge. We want to, you know, criticize, but we've got to put that aside and just really listen to understand instead of listening to judge and listening to respond. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a, a, a way to have essentially nonviolent communication. Yes. And productive, productive communication that leads to some kind of relationship building and shifting of a person's mindset. And there's all these things explained in what the fact about how to do this effectively. But one of the things it talks about is a principle of charity. So where you say back your, your interpretation and your repetition back to somebody is the most charitable translation mm -hmm. of what they've said. So they might say, well, you know what? They put microchips in all the vaccine vials and they're trying to track us. And you, you might say, okay, so what I'm hearing is you think that the government might have some kind of a agenda and perhaps you're aware that in the past governments have done things to control people actually let's talk about the emergency period in India for example right you'd have to get so deep into it but you say it back to them in a way that's like oh I don't, I'm not with the microchip thing but I'm not going to say that but I'm going to say back to you I hear what your deepest concern yeah. is that you maybe you don't rock with the government right now and you don't trust the fact that they are doing a mass vaccination campaign when they find it very hard to the government often can't fix potholes like why should we exactly yeah but then that, that then then they can feel like okay she gets me like she and yes. you, you're not saying I believe in the microchip theory but you're saying I kind of yeah I kind of and you start to build consensus so that even if you don't believe the exact same things often on a deeply human level we do care about the same things somebody might think COVID is a hoax my aunt may not want to get the flu shot and I'm like got mine and adamant that she gets hers we don't agree on the flu vaccine but we agree that both of us love each other and would like each other to stay out of hospital this year and forevermore and so you start to get to that place of consensus and then you build up from there yeah it's really beautiful message it really really is I love the repeat back what you heard them say I mean that's how somebody feels like you get them yeah. and like you said and it also feels like love you know that yeah, is a really important is, thing yeah. and of course in parenting in the parenting world that's what I ask parents to do for their yeah. kids and I think the gift of listening is one of the greatest gifts you can ever give anybody because we all want to be heard. We yes. all want to be heard and stop dismissing what I'm saying. Like, please hear me because it matters to me and it's upsetting me and it's evoking fear and anxiety and all of that in me. And it's okay for us to just listen. We don't have, you know, it's yeah. okay to just do that. You know, and there's an art and a science to this and it's learnable. It. We can get better. And I'm not saying it's easy. Like I said, with my aunt, I want to throw my phone across the room, even though I study this stuff and say there's been a terrible mass shooting in a school one day. And that same evening, you're arguing with your mother about what causes mass shootings. And one of you thinks it's guns and one of you thinks it's something else. I get it. That's heated. But takes and it might feel like I don't even want to listen to this crap. Mm. But there's stuff in what the fact about when to have those conversations, how to have those conversations. Exactly. But there, there is an art and a science to this, and it's life changing once you master that. And I just wish we were teaching it more. So my hope is that what the fact gets into lots of readers hands but especially gets into lots of young readers hands and so we have created a teaching guide to accompany the book um, you can find it on the Pulitzer Center website and what it does is it brings to life the lessons in the book and so it's got lesson plans and chapter guides for teachers to use and it was already being used in classrooms across the country. Wow what an amazing impact that is sure to make that is that is outstanding I love it.
That's so wonderful. I hope so. And just from talking, like doing middle school visits and high school visits and talking to lots of teenagers, they're like, we don't get this right now. We don't get educational critical thinking or how to effectively disagree and debunk or how to separate fact from fiction. So that needs to change. We need media literacy on the curriculum. We need to be having conversations with young kids about critical thinking, about the news, about social media, and about how to have productive, effective conflicts and debates and conversations. Yeah, I love that. So we need scientific literacy, we need media literacy, and we need to understand how to connect with another human and how our brain works. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, I love everything that you've said, Seema. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your book. Uh, it, it, It is such a good read. What the fact, I absolutely loved it. And, and I haven't even read the whole thing yet. And what I've read already, I've learned from, um, I know now about an apple seed. Uh, <laughs> and that was, that was really funny. You'll have to, you'll have to read the book to, to see what I'm talking about. Um, it is just, um, it's so refreshing and it is liberating, um, to, to understand things in a different way. And I hope that people will have an open enough mind to put that dimmer switch on their beliefs. Like you said, I really like that. And, and, and just sort of have a look at how we are biased and what we do is also what our kids are watching. And we do want our kids to have this kind of literacy as well. And it's good for them to know these things too, because it makes them better humans, better people, better citizens, better friends, relatives, partners, And also makes you happier because when you believe all of the corruption and all of that, not that it isn't, not that it doesn't exist, but when, when that occupies your mind, it's a miserable place to live. It is. And just thinking the world is only full of quote unquote fake news and that you have to be skeptical about everything. It's not a nice way to move through the world. And so what the fact helps you kind of reach that balance where you're just a more savvy consumer of information. So I want to just say that that teaching guide that you mentioned, we have it in the parent toolbox. So go to www.parent-toolbox.com to get Shima's or Seema's, sorry, I keep wanting to add an an H to your name, Seema's um, guide so that you can learn as you teach your kids as well. And I think that's just so important. I mean, we're all here doing the best that we can and learning about the way, like I've already said, the way our brain works and our biases. I think it's just, it's really important that we do. So thank you so much for being here. I've learned already from you and I can't wait to dive into this guide and finish reading your book. It's fantastic. What the fact. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for listening to this edition of my podcast, Parenting Our Future. I'm parent coach Robin McMahon. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please share it with someone who you think might also need to hear this message. And don't forget to subscribe. And if you like my work, I'd be grateful if you gave me a five-star rating. For those of you who like my content and want more, visit me at yellingcurebook.com to get your copy of my book and to find other resources to help you. Until next time, I am wishing you and your family peace and connection. Thank you.